The anime regularly portrayed Misty's Goldeen as a useless fish. I find this strange since we already had a useless fish in the form of Magikarp. I guess it's because Goldeen was a fish out of water, however I don't expect that to be the case today. I think this pecking fish might have the potential to be good in a solo playthrough of Pokemon Yellow. I'm excited to find out. The video description contains the rules for my playthrough, some software used in production, and a guide to replace your starter. I nicknamed my Goldeen Rachel after a goldfish that was my first pet when I was a kid, and then I faced the rival in the lab. During this fight, I want to review Goldeen's base stats. They're actually very good for a first stage Pokemon that evolves. Goldeen ranks 5th, tied with Pokemon like Tentacool, Drowsy, and Staryu. That's pretty good company. If we compare all the first stage water types, Goldeen is actually tied for 2nd. It has 45 HP, 67 attack, 60 defense, 50 special, and 63 speed. That gives it a 12% chance to crit. That's pretty good. Its attack and speed are obviously its best stats, and unfortunately, as a water type, its 50 special is kind of a drawback. Surf won't be hitting very hard. Over the summer, I'll be playing the game with all the first stage water types. I started with Seal, and one thing that really held it back was the fact that it didn't get access to any stat boosting moves. Luckily, Goldeen gets access to agility. That's one factor that inspires confidence. It starts with Peck and Tail Whip. Like, why does it start with Peck? Horn Drill makes sense, it's a horny fish after all, but these lips, they really don't look like they're good at pecking. Anyways, Peck is great at the start of the game against all the Caterpie and Viridian Forest. That's another factor that inspires confidence. It gets Bubble Beam, Water Gun, Ice Beam, Blizzard, and Surf, which are all standard fare for water types. These moves are just so great, so that inspires confidence as well. Most notably, Body Slam is missing. This fish obviously wants to kiss and use its horn, but it just doesn't want to get physical with its body. Now, here's a cool fact. It learns Waterfall by level up. Who else thought that Waterfall was a Generation 2 move? I know that I did. Well, in Generation 1, it's actually the Goldeen and Seeking line's signature move. Unfortunately, it has no secondary effect, and it only has base power of 80, so I won't be using it, because Surf is just better. But all of that's pretty far away, let's focus on something that's immediately relevant. What evolution will the rival pick? He picks based on the outcome of the first two battles. I've described it before, and I think I either just got it wrong or misled you by not being specific enough, so I'm going to describe in depth how it works now. If you lose in the lab, he chooses Vaporeon, even if you win at Route 22. If you win in the lab and skip Route 22, then he chooses Flareon. You can't lose on Route 22 because you'll actually black out. Finally, if you win in both locations, then he'll choose Jolteon. It's essentially the developer's way of scaling difficulty for a player whose starter Pokemon is Pikachu. Vaporeon is weak to electric, Flareon is neutral, and Jolteon resists. If you lose the first fight, the rival goes easy on you, if you win the lab fight, he's medium, and if you win both, he's going to be the most challenging. This leads to a frustrating asymmetry for the solo playthroughs that I do, especially if I want to compare the results between different Pokemon. I'd love to be able to play through the game always facing the most difficult team every time, but I don't want to go out of my way giving the Pokemon a disadvantage in real time early on just to get the rival to pick a certain team. For instance, losing in the lab might give Vaporeon, which might be very strong against some Pokemon, but why would I lose in the lab? Doing this means I have slightly less money, it's actually 175 Poké Dollars you don't get, and then you also have less experience. So this slows down the Brock split. In the case of water Pokemon, Jolteon seems like the hardest team to face, and going out of your way to face the optional rival to defeat him is really going to slow things down because a lot of the time these Pokemon can get by Brock with their water moves very early on. To this point, my decision tree has been as follows. Never face Vaporeon unless it requires unrealistic luck to win in the lab. Face Flareon if the Pokemon can defeat Brock right away, and face Jolteon if the optional rival experience allows Pokemon to level up faster for Brock. I could just modify the rival's team with game hooks so that he picks a specific team for each playthrough, however that doesn't really feel right. I want to play a yellow version with only a few changes, perfect DVs, a new starter, and no trash can frustration. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this rival, and I think finally I've come up with an approach that's going to be best and most interesting. Here's how it's going to work. I'll choose the team that I think my Pokemon will have the easiest time defeating for my first playthrough. This makes it a cool active choice that requires knowledge and strategy. Also, it means all my efforts are synergizing together to try to optimize for real-time speed. 
I'll have to answer interesting questions like, will Goldeen struggle against the bulkier Cloister and Magneton, or will it breeze past Jolteon because it has agility that allows it to move first? If Jolteon is easier than Magneton, maybe the optional battle does make sense. If Cloister is difficult, maybe then forcing myself to lose the lab fight and just spamming agility, taking a slightly slower start, might end up being worth it. After completing the first playthrough, I'll test against all three rival teams at the champion fight to determine their difficulty levels, and then my follow-up playthrough will be against the easiest option. With Goldeen, I think it makes sense to face the Flareon team. I should be able to manage the Cloister with special moves and the Magneton with Mimic. I faced Brock at level 12 for the first time. I set up Tail Whip twice, and Peck does very little. I tried to use the remainder of the fight to test to see how much damage I was doing with three Tail Whips, but Goldeen crits instead. I can't do enough damage, and receiving five in return every turn from Geodude's tackle spells defeat. That's my first reset. Back to training. Working for my fish is the fact that it's a bug slaying maniac though with Peck. Working against it though is that it has a medium fast growth rate. The majority of Pokemon in Generation 1 actually use this rate, and it's the second slowest for the early game. This is one of the factors that makes Brock so pivotal in so many Pokemon's performance. If you're Poliwag, you have Bubble and you don't have to grind at all. If you're Goldeen or Seal, you've got to put the time in. At level 14, I try again. I set up four turns of Tail Whip to lower Geodude's defense. When I use Peck, it crits, negating the defense drops I just set up. On the second hit, it doesn't do much more damage, so this is still going to take a while. It's a five hit. Onyx is next. I thought it was going to be easier, but it uses Screech and Bind, and eventually Goldeen goes down. Maybe I need to be one level higher. I decide to attack Onyx right away, and then set up when it uses Bide, but Peck does what looks like one damage, so I should probably just go for the Tail Whips first instead. Unfortunately, things don't play out well. Here's the audio from my fourth attempt against Brock. Okay, Brock number four. I think I can do it. I'll try three uh, Tail Whips on the Geodude. One, two, three, and then I think Peck will four hit. And it four hit last time, uh, but that was with four. Yeah, so same number of turns. Less setup is better. Okay, this thing needs to use something that's like bide. There we go. Three turns? Nope. Okay. Holy, that does a lot now. No, 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 no. Let my fish survive, please. <laughs> no. Okay, I'm gonna go to level 16. At least the training is fast. I get to level 16 and attempt again. How much damage will Geodude do to Goldeen? Three. Okay, so at this level, I'll be arriving at the Onyx with significantly more health. Testing later will help me determine how many Tail Whips I should be using against the Geodude. Like, I wanna be very precise, but for now, three's enough, and then four pecks later it falls. Onyx is next. I had to decide if I wanted to set up or attack again. Setup seems to make the most sense though. Onyx uses Bide early on, and by the time Goldeen starts attacking, it's dealing decent damage. Another Bide happens, I get more Tail Whips in, and that puts Peck in range to knock Onyx out in two more hits. So I've done it. That's a 16 minute and seven Brock split for Goldeen. And now here's what I was thinking as I journeyed out onto the next route. Oh, I didn't. I, I can't believe I didn't heal before this, and I can't believe Peck didn't one-shot that. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, well, that was close, but Goldeen made it, and I'm able to heal up before the next battle. There aren't any more issues, and I make it to Mount Moon without a setback. Here, I pick up the TM for Water Gun, and at this moment, I just want to reflect on the advantages that water types get in these games. They are great against Brock. They get access to an early same type TM right after him. Misty's good AI makes her easier to face. They also get access to Bubble Beam after defeating her. They have an amazing 100% accurate stab move in the form of Surf, a move that you must have to complete the game. And their typing is great against the League. So I mentioned Misty's good AI. In Generation 1, this script prioritizes moves that have a type that's super effective against your Pokemon's type, and deprioritizes moves that are not very effective. There's a complex way it actually checks the types, and that sometimes leads to weird scenarios, but that isn't relevant right now. If we examine Misty's movesets, she only has normal and water type moves. That means that the only damage dealing move she's ever going to use against Goldeen is Tackle. So I think that this fight is going to be possible right now. I've got a strategy to make it work, so let's try this out. Here's my strategy. Use Tail Whip twice on Staryu to make it a 2 hit with Peck. 
After that, I can set up Supersonic and use Tail Whip to lower Starmie's defense. When it hits itself in confusion, the game uses Starmie's attack stats and its defense stat to calculate damage. So the more Tail Whips I get, the more self-inflicted damage is going to occur. Also, once it's missed a couple times, Peck will be really powerful and I can take it down. Here's what happened next. If it only hits itself. Oh, I didn't want to use Water Gun. No! No! <laughs> no! <sighs> uh. I should be able to do this if Starmie damages itself with Supersonic more regularly. Unfortunately, it doesn't. I continue setting up, meanwhile Starmie does a lot of damage, and finally when Goldeen starts to attack, it's just too late. That's a second loss. Supersonic once again fails me, and that's sort of to be expected because this move has trash accuracy. So I've lost three times now, I need a new approach, it would be really nice to not have to use Supersonic. And what I come up with is pretty silly. Let's try Bide. Two Tail Whips followed by three pecks knocks the Star you out. Now it's time for Star Me. And here I have Bide. For whatever reason, I decide not to use it right away though, and I go for Tail Whip and then follow it by a peck. This only does a tiny amount of damage. Alright, it's time to use Bide. It absorbs two turns of damage, but doesn't quite deal enough to knock the Starmie out, and Goldeen goes down again. Alright, that was just bad play. I'll play this better, and I'll be able to do it in the next fight. This time Misty doesn't use an X defend on Staryu, so I take it out with two pecks. That's nice, that's a little bit faster. Oh, I guess I was also going too fast because I forgot to teach Goldeen Bide. I guess I'm going to have to win this one with the supersonic strategy from before. Because of luck, it's working this time and Starmie goes down. With that, Goldeen has earned the Cascade Badge. And with it, I'm set up for success against the rival on Nugget Bridge. The entire reason that I wanted to face her first was just so that I could use this powerful water move on this next section of the game. It'll really speed things up. It also ensures that I one-hit the Sand True, preventing Sand Attack. This is very important, at least for my, uh, my frustration and stress levels. Radita has a low base special, so it falls in a single hit, and while Eevee's special is pretty good, it just isn't a threat. With the hard-earned bubbles, Goldeen makes great pace through Nugget Bridge. The last at the end of Route 25 can be quite challenging for Water-type Pokémon to defeat, especially Water Rock types. These two are coming up. It's gonna be rough. However, today Peck gives me an answer for the Oddish and Bubble Beam one-shots the Pidgey. Now I'm starting to see the advantage of Peck. High attack with a flying type move gives Goldeen coverage for all the grass Pokemon. On my way back to Cerulean, I always make the decision to either heal in the Pokemon Center one more time, or just proceed without healing. I can use Ethers and Elixirs to replenish my PP. Today, I think Goldeen has enough and I can head south immediately. Bubble Beam takes out the Rocket's Machop and Horn Attack takes down the Drowsy. This junior trainer right before Vermilion City is scary in most playthroughs because of Sand Attack, but Bubble Beam just one-shots all the birds. I raid the SSN for useful items, a max potion, an ether, rest, and a rare candy. No body slam today. <laughs> Very sad about that. <laughs> Goldeen doesn't have access to any good normal moves, actually. Horn attack is basically the best thing that I've got that doesn't deal recoil damage. I uh, really hate recoil damage, so I will not be using those moves unless things are going very badly. Don't worry, I am reading all the comments, and I'm making a concerted effort to remember that moves like Submission do work in rare situations, but uh, I just don't want them to work. <laughs> <sighs> Moving on. With the rival out of the way, I decide to skip Surge and head to Rock Tunnel first. Here's a quick Pokemon challenge tip. Field moves are displayed in the party menu in the order they appear in the Pokemon's moveset. As a result, rearranging moves in battle also rearranges them outside of battle. So when teaching Charmander its two field moves, Dig and Cut, I teach Dig first so that it goes in the empty slot at the bottom of Charmander's moveset, and then I can spam A through the Cut dialog and put it in slot 1. I have more things to cut in the playthrough, so that's one advantage that it's in the first slot, it's just one less action that I have to do, but also, I have before, in rare circumstances, accidentally clicked Dig when in Victory Road trying to use Strength if it's on my Charmander. So yeah, Dig is always in slot two just so I don't accidentally teleport back to Viridian City. It is the most painful thing. This is also the reason that you'll notice that I pick up Squirtle in all these playthroughs. I want strength on a Pokemon that is not Charmander. It's time for the Wrapping Lass, and she's a bit shocking today. Wrapping Lass, but I've got Peck. Should be good. Ah! Holy, okay, I got Poison. Poison is actually the perfect thing to happen in this fight. 
because uh, paralysis is the thing that messes you up. So now I've won. The, this thing doesn't have any grass moves. It only has wrap and growth. Next is the status condition junior trainer. Once again, Peck doesn't KO the Oddish and it uses Stun Spore. Yuck. But it's not that bad in this fight because Balbazar doesn't know wrap. Remember in Viridian City when I bought a Paralyze heal? That's specifically for this trainer. I can also use it after the Wrapping Lass or the mandatory Arbok trainer in Sylph. You might wonder why I don't buy two or three just in case. Well, there's a hidden full restore between Cerulean and Vermilion and it acts as a backup. At the end of the tunnel, the self-destructing hiker gets washed away and now I've made it to the mid game. I head south and pick up the TM for Swift. Horn attack is more powerful, but perfect accuracy can't be underestimated, especially against Koga, Sabrina, and Giovanni. So I'll hold off teaching it. In Celadon, I collect useful items, PP up, PP up, nugget, HP up, and rare candy. In the department store, I proceed through the floors sequentially. On floor 2, I buy 10 repels. I'd also buy 4 great balls if I failed to catch a Pidgey in Viridian Forest. On floor 3, I grab TM18. It's free. On floor 4, I sell items. Typically 3 nuggets, buy and a few other TMs, including TM18. Yeah, it's just useful for money. <laughs> After that, I buy 2 polka dolls. I skip floor 5 and head to the vending machines where I buy one of each drink. That way I can spam A through all the dialogue with the girl. She sometimes like backs away from you and it's really annoying. You have to walk towards her again and like track her down. Yeah, I just want to spam A here. After that, I pick up a fresh water and go back to floor 5. Here I sell Rock Slide and Tri Attack. Having to actually scroll down to the bottom of my inventory allows me to confirm that I did get the fresh water. I build in a lot of little checks like this into my playthroughs so that I prevent mistakes that lead to backtracking. With all my selling done, I purchase three Carbos. Doing the shopping in this order leaves me close to the elevator, and I can take it to floor one and exit through the door that's closer to the Fly Girl's house, which is my next stop. By the way, I bought three Carbos specifically because there's a big level jump in the mid game of Yellow, and I really want to be able to move first against Koga's Venomoth. If I can defeat it, then I'll get the speed boost from his badge, and that'll allow me to make up for being under leveled. After grabbing Fly, it's time to backtrack and face Surge. This does have a time cost, but I'm glad that I did it. Even at level 30, Goldie doesn't really have a solid answer for him. Okay, Surge. Uh, I don't really know what to do. Like, I gotta get Fly. Is he just gonna... He's just gonna die. <laughs> oh, Surge is so bad. This has got to be one of the worst gym leaders. So yeah, what do you think? Of all the gym leaders in yellow, is Surge the worst? If you want me to do a short gym leader tier list video at some point, let me know in the comments. I think it would be kind of fun ranking them all. Next is the rival in Pokemon Tower. And honestly, he isn't as easy as he usually is, but Goldeen still makes it past him. Against the Chandler, I decide to use Peck. It's physical, Goldeen has higher attack than special attack, and Ghastly doesn't have good defense. Turns out both Bubble Beam and Peck require two turns, so it doesn't matter which one I use. The fight was a bit scary, as it always is against these ghosts, but I managed to pull through. I use the first Pokedal to skip Marowak. I'm sure some of you will tell me that this is against my rules because it's a glitch. I prefer playing this way, but uh, thanks for helping with the YouTube algorithm. Now, against Jesse and James, it's starting to become apparent that Goldeen is going to get outclassed very soon. Bubble Beam isn't doing much damage anymore, and I'm underleveled. I don't have my stat raising move yet to make up for these flaws. Luckily, I'm going to be able to make a trip to the Safari Zone soon and grab Surf. On my way, I grab two hidden items on Cycling Road. There's a rare candy here and a PP up. Fun fact, if you hold B, it actually acts as a break for the bike, so that way you can maneuver around more precisely. In the Safari Zone, I grab Carbos, Protein, Gold Teeth, and Surf. Well, my uh, pack's full, but I want to get it, so I uh, toss Thunderbolt, which feels really weird. After that, I teach Goldeen its most powerful water move. Now, there's a bit of a conundrum. Where do I go next? Erica seems like a bad idea at level 32, Koga is too overleveled, and the rival in Sylph has Magneton. I think it's time to invest in some training. I start this in Sylph against this guy. I uh, never save in front of him, but I really should start making a point of it. His Machoke hits Goldeen, and it brings me down to three hit points. Just a slightly better roll, and I would have lost so much progress right here. Now that I've made it past this guy, the training gets a lot easier. I do save more than usual though, I'm like a bit paranoid now. After defeating the rockets that don't have electric types, I dig out of Sylph and fight the trainers in the dojo. 
I continue training in Erica's gym. Ice Beam and Peck make this experience fast and easy. Now, I think that it's time to face the Grass-type Master. Can I do it? Let's find out. Erica opens with Tangela. I choose Ice Beam, it takes the Vine Monster into orange, and then Goldeen gets hit with Vine Whip. Okay, so I tank that pretty well. I finish it off, Weeping Bell comes out, Ice Beam doesn't KO, and Erica uses Razor Leaf. But it misses. Whew. Next is Gloom, and I think that I'm going to need a one hit here. Unfortunately, it survives, uses Petal Dance, but Goldeen hangs on. If Weeping Bell had hit with Razor Leaf, I definitely would have lost. So that's a lucky win. I've got to test Erica later on. The Sylph Rival seems more manageable now than Koga at this level, just because the Venomoth is level 50. It's also an electric type. Sandslash falls to a single Surf. Cloyster has lower special than defense, so Surf is decent here. It only knows water type damaging moves, so the rival's good AI is just going to spam Supersonic over and over. It is a normal move, after all. I barely miss the damage needed for the 3 hit, and then get confused just before it goes down. Next is Magneton. This is the Pokemon that I'm most worried about. Surf does just under half, Thundershock does about the same to me, but the following turn it crits and Goldeen goes down. I tried again, but this time I get a worse roll on Magneton and Thundershock crits right away. A few more levels should give me the 3 hit on Cloyster and the 2 hit on Magneton, so I can just train more. I want to save my rare candies because it's a first playthrough, like I don't know how the end of the game is going to play out, and I really might need them later on. At level 46, I attempt the rival again. Will I get the 3 hit on Cloyster? Looks like it. Goldeen gets confused, hits Surf, hits itself, and then takes the opponent out. Now, will Magneton go down in 2 hits? It doesn't look like it. However, a crit assists me, so I do get it. I peck the Kadabra, probably should have kept Horn Attack around for this. Ugh. <sighs> Flareon's last, it tries a bite, doesn't do much, and I've won. At Giovanni, I was starting to monitor my speed, and I was hoping that defeating him would give me what I needed to move first against the Venomoth. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Goldeen has 102 speed, and Venomoth has 103. So one more level will do it. I finish off some of the extra trainers in Koga's gym, and some by Cycling Road. After that, I'm ready. Venonat is first. My first Surf doesn't quite knock it out, and it puts Goldeen to sleep. While I do wake up the very next turn, then it still gets to use Psychic and lowers my special in the process. I knock the first one out, but the second one confuses me and Goldeen hits itself. Ah, so like this fight's going really badly. I'm left with red health, and Koga still has two more Pokemon. I was feeling very hopeless here. Maybe YOLO Horn Drill strats can work? Oh well, oh oh oh, I do outspeed. Yes! What? I did it! Horn drill! Coming through! Ah, oh, the horny fish does it! And it's only gonna get better. Blaine's gym is next. I skip all the trainers, head straight for him. Ninetales is first, Surf does more than half, and I finish it off the next turn. Rapidash comes out. Then I realize that Goldeen isn't moving first. Now I'm trapped in a not very effective fire spin. During the boredom of this slow defeat, I reflected on my situation. Oh no. It does have 100, I think it was 118 speed. It's very unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. It must have 118 speed. Now I have more because it badge boosted me with Growl. Uh, it's like, I could horn drill. Oh, yes! Did it! First attempt! Sweet! I grab Mimic, steal a nugget, and then head to Sabrina's gym. I go into this fight knowing that I won't outspeed her Alakazam. I avoid Flash from Abra. Kadabra's next. Surf does one third, it gets an X defend, and I crit. Alakazam is last. I start using Ice Beam because I know that this fight's gonna be slow. I'm really hoping for a freeze here. Also, if you have to use a move over and over and over again, it becomes more and more likely that you're gonna get the freeze. Looks like I'm doing one fifth every turn. During all of this, Psywave actually does a good amount of damage. And after that, Psychic knocks Goldeen out. I've saved all my rare candies. I think that it would be a bit stubborn to not use them at this point, so I level up to level 54 so that Goldeen learns agility. First turn, I set it up to ensure that I move first against Alakazam. Abra misses Flash, that's convenient. I use Ice Beam, it does half, and then my accuracy gets lowered. I take it down, Kadabra's next. I decide to finish my setup here, but that lets it get a Kinesis in. This move, might actually be worse than Sand Attack now that I really think about it. It's like the late game Sand Attack, and I hate it. 
The nice thing though is that Kinesis does actually cause the badge boost to occur, so Surf's now dealing a lot of damage to Alakazam, and I managed to take it out. Before I face what is uh, probably going to be the easiest gym leader of all for Goldeen, I head to Celadon and grab some vitamins. I fight a few optional trainers in Giovanni's gym to level up, and I want to use rare candies so that Goldeen's speed stat is 136. This way, I'll move first against Doug Trio, and I can prevent Fissure. It only takes four to get my speed where it needs to be, and then I go head to head with him. Doug Trio's first, Surf takes it down in a single hit. Persian's next, setup here doesn't make sense because once it's out of the way, I'm just gonna sweep. It takes two turns and then Goldeen's off to the races. The surfing races, that is. It knocks out the remaining three team members in a single hit each, so yeah, very easy. The pre-league rival blocks my way to the league. I saved Horn Drill for this fight. Hopefully it's going to come through and get me past the Magneton. Surf 1 hits the Sand Slash, Execute follows, and Ice Beam takes it out. Cloister is next. Once again, it's just going to spam Supersonic. Goldeen is still confused though when Magneton finally comes out. It hits itself, Thundershock does a lot, Horn Drill misses, because of course it does, and Thunder Wave paralyzes. Now, if you're slower than the target, one hit KO moves will never work. I uh, accidentally use it again, and again, <laughs> and those misplays result in a loss. I try again, this time I try Surf against Magneton and it's a two hit. As a result, Thunder Wave paralyzes. This is really why I wanted to use Horn Drill, because now Kadabra moves first, uses Psychic, and blasts Goldeen away. In the next fight, I revert to my prior strategy with one addition. This time I'm going to use Horn Drill to take the Cloister out. I don't want Supersonic to mess with me. I try for it, and it works. So Magneton's next, I'm going to try here again, and it fails. But I don't get paralyzed, so I get another attempt, and this time Goldeen headbutts the Magnets into Oblivion. Kadabra follows, Surf does around half, and then on my next turn, I get a Gen 1 miss. Just great. That's really unfortunate. While I do take the Kadabra out the following turn, Flareon's next, and it has like decent special, it survives, and that's it. So I lost because of a Gen 1 miss. Feels really great. The next fight, Horn Drill has some seriously awful accuracy problems. Right here, you might wonder, why don't you just use X accuracy to make the Horn Drill bypass accuracy checks? This way I could sweep the rival team with it. Well, you very clearly didn't read my rules, which banned the use of items. The reason I don't do this is because so many Pokemon could rely on this sort of strategy with either Horn Drill or Fissure in the late game, and then it wouldn't be that interesting or fun. It's similar with why I decided to ban the use of Double Team. Pretty much every Pokemon can learn it, and almost everyone should use it whenever the fight's going to be difficult. Double Team also has the added advantage of boosting your stats. It is a badge boost move, so yeah, I really don't like that move. I banned it until level 100. We'll, uh, we'll have to see if any Pokemon actually end up using it. I don't think anyone will. I go back into the fight with a new strategy. I set up Agility three times at Sand Slash. This gives all my stats a boost because I have all the badges. But then Goldeen immediately levels up. <sighs> I should have remembered that that was happening. So I switch things up again. I teach Goldeen Mimic and take Sand Slash's Slash. Maybe this can do more damage on the Magneton. I crit Cloister, making it a two hit, and it misses Supersonic. It's very convenient. Moment of truth. Does Slash help against Magneton? Nope. It's still going to take two turns. Goldeen gets paralyzed. It doesn't move as a result. It takes two Thundershocks and actually manages to take the Magneton out. However, Slash does really help against the Kadabra. It takes it down, and that leaves me with enough health to survive a hit from Flareon. But I won't need to, because it uses Leer, boosting my special, and now I should one hit with Surf. <sighs> Unless I get another Gen 1 miss. <laughs> That's the second one while attempting this fight. My next Surf connects, and with that, Goldeen's off to the league. Lorelei's first. Now, Goldeen can't learn any moves that are super effective against water types. The best I can hope for here is neutral damage. This makes me worry a bit, because Dugong loves to use Rest. If I can't KO it in three hits, there's the potential for Goldeen to just be walled. Luckily, Lorelei's use of Super Potions helps me out, so I take it down. Cloister's next. I was hoping for a two hit, but it takes three. If you've watched a lot of my videos, you'll know that a fantastic strategy against Lorelei is stealing Slowbro's Amnesia. 
with it, I can set up. This boosts my special to ridiculous levels. However, in this case, I don't have any recovery options, so I'm not surviving long enough and Goldeen goes down. Because I was worried about the dugong, I used two PP ups on Surf before I go back into the fight. I also used a single rare candy to prevent the mid-battle level up so that my stats don't get reset. Dugong takes longer this time, Cloyster takes less damage, and now I'm bruised for the Slowbro. It sets up while I do, and then Psychic finishes me again. I was resisting using Rest on my moveset because I wanted to keep Ice Beam a little bit longer. Having it for Agatha would be nice, I could potentially freeze. However, with Rest, the fight against Lorelei is very easy. After mimicking Amnesia, I can heal and then slowly take out her remaining Pokemon. Well, as, uh, as slowly as using Surf after full Amnesia setup is. <laughs> With that out of the way, I get a bit of a breather for myself, and I'm able to sort of collect my thoughts and prepare for Agatha, the Ghost Master. She opens with Gengar. I mimic Substitute, and then I realize that Mega Drain is able to break it in one hit. That's really bad. It's really good though that she doesn't have good AI, because then she'd just spam it over and over again. Setting up with Agility boosts my special, giving my Substitute a bit more staying power. Gengar goes down, I accidentally use Substitute one extra time. And then I finish the Golbat off with two Surfs. Haunter's next. Surf does more than half, it misses Hypnosis, and I finish it. Against Arbok, my battered substitute breaks. I take time to set it up again and then knock the snake out. Gengar is last. Unfortunately, Hypnosis can still hit you when you have a substitute in place, so it gets it, Goldeen doesn't wake up, and that's a frustrating loss. Gen 1 is strange in all sorts of ways, and Substitute is very weird. It completely blocks stat-lowering moves, it blocks Confuse Ray and Supersonic, but it doesn't stop moves like Hypnosis, Thunder Wave, and Sleep Powder. Agatha doesn't know what she's doing though, so I win on my next attempt. Now I'm worried, because Goldeen faces a problem. I think that I'm gonna need Surf, Rest, Agility, and Mimic to defeat the champion. But I think I need Surf, Rest, Blizzard, and Agility to defeat Lance. Unfortunately, there's no way to make that happen. I'll save before I teach Goldeen Blizzard, just as a precaution so that I can reset to this moveset. I'll try deleting Agility first, because I think Mimic is going to be required for the champion's Magneton. Gyarados is first. Hyper Beam does so much. Unfortunately, because of my moves, I have to take it slow against this thing, and that gives time to Lance to set up Leers, and then strike back with a second Hyper Beam. Okay, I'll uh, try this again. This time, I forgot to teach Blizzard. But as soon as Goldeen goes down, I realize that maybe setting up with agility will boost my special and defense enough to take less damage from Gyarados. I do end up waiting to try that and attempt the Blizzard strategy one more time. This time I make it to the Dragonair, but I'm so bruised. I try to heal, Thunderbolt does so much, and uh, I have to attempt the sweep. However, Aerodactyl has 170 speed, it moves first, and Goldeen falls. Okay, let's try the agility strats now. That means that I'm going to remove Mimic for Blizzard. If I win, I won't have Earthquake for Magneton. Gyarados takes forever to knock out, but this feels so much better. Now all I have to do is hope that Blizzard hits. Dragonair 1 falls, Dragonair 2 falls, and with all my agilities, I've got a fast fish, so Aerodactyl also goes down. And then Blizzard misses Dragonite. <laughs> that thing's huge, and it's a Blizzard. How does it ever miss? Lance selects Thunder, but Goldeen survives and finishes the dragon off. But the strongest trainer in the game is left, and I don't have Mimic anymore. Can I still do it? Let's find out. Sandslash is first. I decide to set up because I think I need the extra damage for Alakazam. Earthquake is only doing a third to Goldeen, so we take another turn to boost my stats. My Surf gets the KO, Alakazam comes out, it uses Recover, that's really annoying. P please stop. It does by using Kinesis. Okay, I uh, didn't mean that. Please just keep using Recover. Despite the Kinesis and the accuracy drop, I still hit with Surf and Executor comes out. Now, because the champion has good AI, it's forced to spam Leech Seed over and over again, so I set up Agility and use Rest to heal twice before taking it down with two Blizzards. It's the Pokemon that I've been worried about now, Magneton. Goldeen uses Surf, it does more than half, Thunderbolt zaps my fish, and it survives on red. That's it. Well, it would be, but I have to make it through the Cloister first, and when Leech Seed is draining my health, this can really become a stall fest. I'm able to successfully recover with rest, but Cloister heals while I'm asleep. 
I've been in this situation before, facing the champion's fantastic stall tactics. This really only comes about because I'm doing a solo challenge and I can't use items. As a kid, these tactics never really bothered me, but today they're really annoying. Leech Seed continues to heal Cloyster. I need to be careful because if Spike Cannon crits, all the hits do the same amount of damage, so I want to keep Goldeen healthy. Spike Cannon is eventually going to roll bad damage, and then I can strike back. But if it doesn't get bad damage a few times in a row, then I'll be stuck healing. Or if it gets bad damage every now and again, then I have to heal because I can't be in low health. I'm on a timer because when Rest's PP runs out, that's it. I'll have to just go for it and use Surf. But in this case, Cloyster stalls Goldeen out all the way until Rest's PP is gone. Uh, this is my last chance. <gasps> uh... Let's stall fast. This would be absolutely brutal if I was playing on one time speed. I can't even imagine doing this on one time speed. Just like, uh, it would be so bad. Okay, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I just need one. No, maybe I need two more hits. That's so awful. If I need two more hits. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yes, yes, yes. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yes, we did it. Goldeen clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 41 minutes, and 49 seconds. To achieve this, it was level 68, had 23 resets, and got a game time of 5 hours and 33 minutes. Now, let's have a bit of fun while I face Mewtwo. Well, I can just freeze it, but that's not very fun. Let's try and play straight up. Because this fight's just for fun. Okay. So, we're just doing nothing. Okay, Goldeen, you're doing pretty good damage. Mm, that Swift did a lot. Okay, well, uh, you two. What are you doing, buddy? Just didn't do anything. Just sat there, set up barrier. All right, good job, little fish. <gasps> uh... Now that the first playthrough is behind me, it's time to do some optimization. The fights that I think are most in need of improvements and analysis are Brock, Misty, Surge, Erica, Koga, the Sylph rival, Sabrina, the pre-league rival, Lance, and the champion, so it's quite a few. I'll start at the end of the game and work backwards, that way I know what level I'm shooting for in the overall playthrough and I can more intelligently plan my training in the mid game. The champion is brutal in solo playthroughs, Alakazam can really mess things up for Goldeen here with Kinesis or just by attacking. Executor gives me a chance to set up, but it isn't for free because Leech Seed is now whittling me away. Here's a funny fact, watch my speed as Magneton paralyzes me. Yep, I'm uh, still outspeeding everything, so agility is very useful because of that. Moving first and then being able to two-shot the Magneton means that it only gets one attack in, even when it uses Thunder Wave just because of agility. My speed also matters against the Cloister. Now I can move first, ensuring that I can heal before it gets to roll the dice with Spike Cannon. Unfortunately, this still isn't consistent. However, I think that I can make it consistent by using Toxic instead of Blizzard. I can use this against Executor, of course Surf 2 shots the Magneton, and then I can use Toxic again on Cloyster and heal while it fades away. At Flareon I'll outspeed so that I can heal if I really need to, unless it uses Quick Attack that is, so I think that this is the best way to approach it. There is one more thing that I think I should address before I test to see what the win-loss ratio will be here. Right now, Goldeen is speed tied with Alakazam. I could use agility, but then I take damage from Sand Slash. I think that the solution here is easy. I should plan to arrive at level 68 with 157 speed instead. Now let's test. The main threats are 1. Alakazam, using either Kinesis or getting a special drop, or uh, ending the battle by just attacking consistently. 2. Magneton getting paralysis and Goldeen not being able to move. I should also point out that the move ordering against Executor is very important. I use agility, then toxic, then two more agilities, and finally rest. This way Goldeen wakes up the turn that Toxic finishes the Executor. If I use Toxic first turn, then I'll still be asleep when the Magneton comes out. And that's really bad because in Generation 1, you can't attack the turn you wake up. With this strategy, I won 3 times and lost 7 times against the champion. 30% is okay, but I'd really like to do better. What happens if I use Mimic instead? Because I'll be coming from a state where I have both Agility and Mimic, there is no space for Toxic anymore. That slows things down against the Executor, but it isn't impossible. On my first test, Earthquake one-shots the Magneton because of a critical hit. The following Cloister was a great test showing that I can consistently survive here and take it down. Now, do I one-hit the Magneton every time with Earthquake when it doesn't crit? Well, I get a crit again with my next test, but after that it becomes clear that Earthquake is getting the job done in a single hit. Now, with Mimic on my moveset, what's the win-loss ratio? Well, while I was playing this fight, I actually figured out an improvement. 
instead of setting up an Executor, I can use Agility twice on Sandslash, and that gives me a one-hit range on Alakazam with Earthquake. Doing this, I went 9-1 and one against the champion, and the one loss was actually before I figured this out and Alakazam knocked Goldeen out. The ideal ordering here is to use two agilities first, that boosts my defense, minimizing damage from Sandslash, then steal Earthquake, one hit the Alakazam, finish my setup against Executor, heal against it, slowly knock it out, Earthquake KOs Magneton, three surfs for Cloyster, and a single surf for Flareon. I just need to make sure that I arrive at his ace with more than 40 hit points to ensure that I live through a quick attack. For me, it doesn't really make sense to test against the Vaporeon team. Alakazam is going to be the same, and Magneton is at a higher level in this case, so it's more likely to survive. Plus, Vaporeon's pretty tanky. But what about Jolteon? Everything up until his fourth Pokémon is exactly the same. Cloyster is now weaker, and that reduces the damage that Goldeen takes by a tiny bit. I still do need three hits to knock it out though. In this case, there's no Magneton. Ninetales does no quick attack, which can be bad in some situations. Finally, Jolteon's his ace, and it's scary because it's very fast. However, agility has made my fishy very quick. Because of that, I can use Earthquake and knock it out. Honestly, if this fight is manageable in Sylph, fighting the optional rival would help with training for Brock, and the champion is just as easy when he has Jolteon as when he has Flareon. Now, how do I get to the champion with this moveset? Can I beat Lance with Surf, Rest, Agility, and Mimic? I can Mimic Ice Beam from the second Dragonair. The difficulty is just getting there with not very effective damage. Using Agility right away buffs Goldeen up a bit, but it does open me up to lose against Gyarados. When Dragonair comes out in my second fight, I was surprised with how much Surf did. Goldeen survives Thunderbolt, and from there the sweep is insured. The second Dragonair is never going to use Ice Beam, so he can't freeze me, and my speed stat is ensuring that I move first. I win two times, and I lose eight times with this strategy, so it's possible, I'm just not very confident in it. An alternate approach would be to set up and then mimic Hyper Beam. If Gyarados has set up two Leers and badge boosted Goldeen, then the stolen move one hits Lance's first three Pokemon. Surf takes care of Aerodactyl, and I just need to survive one Thunder from Dragonite. After all, its special isn't great. Both of these strategies are inconsistent. I can win though, and it doesn't take that long because usually I lose at the Gyarados. If I plan for this one fight to be inconsistent, I still think that I'll make it through the game faster overall. Now to test the pre-league rival. He was tough, and honestly, I made this one hard on myself by just trying to use Horn Drill. Since I need rest for Lorelei, I can just use it in this fight anyways. Agility is also fantastic in combination with this move because of how Paralysis works in Generation 1. When it affects your Pokémon cutting their speed to a quarter, it permanently does this. Even if you heal and remove the Paralysis, your speed is still cut. But if you use Agility, it actually boosts your stat back to its original value and then adds the stage modifiers, so it completely heals Paralysis' speed drop. So I can save one turn of setup and recover my lost speed if I don't want to use Rest later in the fight. Or I can fully set up, and that completely negates the speed drop from Paralysis, because Max Agility multiplies my speed by 4, and Paralysis divides it by 4, so it's net neutral. The strategy here is simple. Set up Agility at Cloyster, because it's only going to use Supersonic. I only need 2 to ensure that I 2 hit the Cloyster, and the Magneton, and the Kadabra. Also, because it only uses Supersonic, Rest is a free heal here. I really don't want to set up against the Execute, even though it's weaker, because it's going to use Leech Seed, or it's going to try for Solar Beam. Yeah, that doesn't seem good. As I was playing my tests, I realized that using Ice Beam first turn against Magneton will be better than two Surfs, because it could also freeze. Also, it is best to just set up three agilities right away. There's no point wasting a turn later on if I get paralyzed just to get my speed back to where it needs to be. If I have all of the agilities set up anyways, then the paralysis cuts my speed and I still move first. Finally, when I make it to Flareon, I should really just use a rest if I'm at low health. I do not want to get knocked out by Smog. I went 10-0 against him with this new strategy, so that is very consistent. Back to Sabrina. I went into this with my prior moveset. By the way, look at how bad her Alakazam is in yellow. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. Well, uh, I guess it's good if it uses Psychic. In this case though, it doesn't and I win. I was going to play 10 fights to test and see what the win-loss ratio was with this strategy, but then I realized something. What if I can set up fully on the Abra? That would make this fight way easier but my accuracy would be shredded in doing that because I'll get hit by Flash multiple times. However, I can take Swift into the fight, taking advantage of Goldeen's attack stat and bypassing accuracy checks. Then it's sunk in. 
why not just sit here and keep using agility and let Abra use flash over and over and over? Each time it hits me, it boosts my attack stat with the badge boost, and eventually Goldeen has 358 attack. With that, Swift can sweep Sabrina's entire team. This fight is 100% consistent now. So, Koga is a weird one in this playthrough. Goldeen isn't fast enough to outspeed the Venomoth until level 51. I tried mimicking Sleep Powder, but then Venonat just uses Sleep Powder because it's a grass move and it wants to get me with a status. Yeah, it doesn't seem very good. If I do get past all of his gnats, Venomoth still outspeeds. The reason this fight is strange is that I'm struggling to get enough speed. And uh, as we just saw prior, <laughs> Goldeen is quite fast usually. If only it had agility. But it learns it at level 54, and by that point I already outspeed. So Koga's this sort of like middle ground of just awful, where it's like a little bit too hard and I'm a little bit too slow, and then all of a sudden I'm way too fast and this is really easy. Further complicating things is the fact that if I want to mimic Sleep Powder, then I constrain my moveset a lot. Rest and Mimic together would be great, but then I won't have the moveset that I just tested at Sabrina, because there's no slot for Swift. I considered if I was teaching Surf too early, but then all the training that I have to do to get to level 50 will be much slower. So what's the answer here? First, I wanted to test to see what level I needed to one-shot his Venonats. In this case, Surf is better than Peck. At level 54, I still don't one-shot the third one, so I could set up Agility on the second Venonat because it doesn't know Sleep Powder. I'll get confused in the process, but this seems like the best idea. Turns out the second Venonat was also a crit last time and I didn't notice, so yeah, it's also not going down. Okay, there might be another solution here. What if I mimic Psychic? I'm still going to go to sleep on the first turn, but at least I can sweep the Venonats after that. I get a Gen 1 miss along the way, Venomoth takes half, lowers my special, and Goldeen crits for the win. Okay, this strat has some promise. If I need level 54 to get the consistent 2 hit on the Venomoth, then I might as well do Sabrina first. In this case, I can replace Swift with Rest, and that'll really help for this fight. I thought this might let me heal, however, then I knock myself out in confusion. And then it sinks in. Mimic takes a turn, I get put to sleep, and the first Venonat is probably going to lower my special with Psychic. After that, Psychic loses its punch, and this fight is no longer consistent. This is frustrating. Last time I got two lucky horn drills, and that allowed me to get through this fight, and I really don't want that to be the solution. Then it hit me. I've been operating with a bias here. I thought that Mimic was gonna help, but maybe it's just dead weight. My special being lowered actually badge boosts my attack. Goldeen has better attack anyways. I need Swift for Sabrina, and Venomoth knows double team. Perhaps Swift is gonna be the better attacking move in this case. Well, it's only doing half. <laughs> After all my agilities, it still doesn't get the KO, plus it's a 2 hit for the Venomoth, so it can still finish me with Psychic. In the end, I think that the Sleep Powder strat might just be the best, so let's test and see what the win-loss ratio is. I end up with a score of 6 to 4, and I guess in this case, we're gonna have to take that. Because of how overleveled I need to be going into Koga and Sabrina, I can delay Erika for a long time. She'll be easier as a result. What about Surge? Well, here's what happens when he uses Thunderbolt. Level 30, Goldeen survives. That means fighting him after Rock Tunnel is much better. Unfortunately, at this level, it's sometimes a roll, and it can KO from full health. I lost five times in a row, so I'm going to test a different strategy. Now it's time to use a TM that I very rarely use. Double Edge. This lets Goldeen 3-hit the Raichu after it uses Growl once. With an untouched attack stat, it can do it in two turns. But now the recoil is making it so that Thunderbolt is more consistently going to knock me out. I tested this against Surge 10 times and I went 5 and 5, it's a lot better than 100% loss, but what level does Goldeen need to survive Thunderbolt consistently? At level 34, it can do it. Also, now Goldeen outspeeds. Bubble Beam is a 3 hit and Double Edge is a 2 hit, so Raichu is only going to get a single attack if I use it. I tested each strategy independently and I went 8 and 2 with each of them, but then I realized that I can combine these two separate approaches. If I use Bubble Beam turn 1, then Goldeen won't take recoil damage, and that allows it to survive a Thunderbolt. Then, if Raichu uses Growl, I can continue using Bubble Beam, and if it doesn't, I can finish the fight with Double Edge. This also opens the door for Bubble Beam's speed drop to potentially counter Surge's X speed. That would prevent Raichu from moving first and getting an extra hit. With this strategy, I go 9 and 1. So Misty. Misty, Misty, Misty. <laughs> she is so annoying for poor Goldeen fitting because her Goldeen in the anime was really bad. Peck's regularly a 4 hit on Staryu, many more if she uses an X defend, 
and a three hit if I crit. With one or two tail whips, Staryu goes down in four turns total. With three tail whips, it takes five, so I think that two tail whips is the best. It also counters X defend if Misty uses it, and attacking twice gives me the opportunity to crit. With more turns of setup, crits will actually start doing less damage. Against Starmie, things are pretty hopeless though, without tail whip and supersonic. The other strategy here is bide. Which one will uh, give the better win-loss ratio? Well, I go 2 and 8 with the supersonic strategy. Bide is very bad against the Staryu. Tackle isn't doing enough damage to me to pay back significant amounts, so Tail Whip and Peck are the obvious solution here. Starmie, on the other hand, does a lot of damage to Goldeen. If I get a 3 turn Bide and Misty crits, then I take Starmie out. However, she can just use X Defend and Harden and prevent Bide from doing anything. It makes me feel really silly. Plus, Starmie outspeeding means that I take damage for free when I'm trying to use Bide. In this fight specifically, it really looks like Misty knows what she's doing. Tackle when Bide finishes, then spam Harden while I'm Biding. Once I'm too low to use Bide anymore, she's set up fully and I have no hope to knock her out. Now I assume that you don't know this. Let me quickly show you the Bulbapedia page for Bide. Here's a quote. The damage received during the period is counted equal to the last amount of damage done. The last amount of damage done will include crash damage, an opponent's self-inflicted confusion damage, and the full damage absorbed by a substitute. An opponent's self-inflicted confusion damage is counted towards Bide. Remember when I said Staryu is a 4 hit with Peck? So yeah, it's always going to be 4 turns even if I use Tail Whip. So I can replace Tail Whip with Bide instead and use Supersonic to confuse the Starmie. This increases the chance that Bide does damage because when the Starmie hits itself in confusion, that damage is counted towards the bide counter. I uh, just want to reflect on this interaction that we can see on screen right now. This is just so strange. I love how there's interesting little errors everywhere in Generation 1. It gives so much flavor to the game, and I love discovering how I can utilize this to help Pokemon that I'm running with. So how does this new supersonic bide strategy do? Well, I went 6 and 4. So this is the best strategy to get Bubble Beam for Nugget Bridge. I could try the rival first, of course, and come back here once it's consistent, but I like these odds. All right, let's get into my second playthrough. I've decided that I'm feeling confident, so I face the optional rival when preparing for Brock. Now, Goldeen is gonna go up against Jolteon. I did test Brock, and here's what I discovered. At level 15, the Geodude is a seven hit pretty much any way I go about it. Using only two Tail Whips ensures that I still 7 hit it, even if Goldeen crits. After that, Onyx is largely luck. If it uses Bide, I'll win. If it sets up with Screech and uses Bind, well, then I'll lose. The reason that level 16 is just so much better for Goldeen is that it has more health and defense. This means that Geodude is only dealing 3 damage instead of 4, and Onyx is only dealing 1 damage instead of 2 with Bind. In Mount Moon, I made a few changes. First of all, I can grab the HP up and give Goldeen more health for its bide strategies. Peck and Water Gun give me great coverage against the trainers in here, so I face most of them to level up more. That gives me two extra levels for Misty. Now, let's see how these bide strats go. I've got to take Staryu out with Peck. At the higher level, it's now actually a three hit. Well, I, uh, I got a crit along the way, so that's nice. Starmie's next. Supersonic hits, Misty X defends, and Goldeen starts to bide. Now, self-inflicted damage, plus tackle, and a critical hit get dealt back to Starmie, taking it to red health. Because of how close I am to the victory, I switch into Peck, and I knock it out over two turns. That's so satisfying that this worked. I want to arrive at Surge at level 34, so I end up fighting a lot of the extra trainers in the next portion of the game. Some of them on the SSN, one in the Rocket Hideout, and some east of Saffron City. It's nice that I can move first with 69 speed, Bubble Beam causes a drop, Surge uses an X speed for a net neutral result, and double edge KOs. So another first battle victory for Goldeen. It's doing really well. The first Chandler ended up getting me in Pokemon Tower because of confusion, but I take my revenge in my second attempt. After that, I settle in for a long session of training. Cycling Road, Sylph, the Dojo, Erica's Gym, and at level 48, I stomp the Grassmaster, and then I head back to Sylph to take care of the rival. Overall, this fight's quite easy. At Cloister, things slow down, Confusion bruises Goldeen, and after Kadabra, I arrive at Jolteon with orange health. So apparently, it's uh, faster than Goldeen. <laughs> Whoops. I could have solved this with rare candies, but I just arrive at the Jolteon with more health. I can survive now, and I take it out. So next, I want to face Sabrina before Koga. And to do this, I'm going to use rare candies so they can get agility and use the completely busted strategy. Obviously, I, uh, I win. 
I actually don't think it's possible to lose with this one. Swift can't even Gen 1 miss because it bypasses the accuracy check. But Koga's next, and this one might be rough. The first Venonat puts Goldeen to sleep, but she wakes up right away. We put Venonat to sleep, set up, and take it out with two surfs. Rinse and repeat. Venonat 2 goes down, but Sleep Powder misses the third, and now I'm the one snoozing. However, I wake up, get Sleep Powder off, and move on to the Venomoth. Sleep Powder does its job. Surf crits, and Koga's defeated. Blaine's next. He's obviously an easy sweep for Goldeen, and Giovanni is the same. But what about the pre-league rival when he has Jolteon? I actually didn't test against his Jolteon team here, and I'm starting to wonder if this was a mistake. I Mimic Slash, set up once, and take the Sand Slash out. Executes next, Sand Slash almost takes it down, and then Goldeen gets paralyzed. But Agility's gonna solve this, so it's not an issue. At Cloister, I finish my setup, heal with rest, surf two hits, Slash KOs the Kadabra, and Jolteon hits the field. It uses Thunder, and it deals so much to Goldeen, but not quite enough. Victory is mine. And then uh, Lorelei's Dugong gets really annoying, wasting my time, healing with rest. But eventually I do manage to defeat it. Cloister's also annoying with Supersonic before it goes down. Then Slowbro teaches me a lesson. This fight isn't going to be consistent because Psychic is neutrally effective against Goldeen. So that's one reset. However, in the next fight I get to Slowbro in a better position and fully set up with Amnesia. From here, I get the sweep. Agatha's really lucky, like Hypnosis and Confusion chained together, it's just awful and Goldeen goes down once. <sighs> at least I defeat her on my next fight. Now I'm back at Lance. This fight is inconsistent. It is the most inconsistent of all the fights that I tested. But I'm making really good time. Even a few resets here will result in a significantly better finish for this fish. Against Gyarados, I want to set up as fast as possible, so the badge boosts raise my defense, preparing me for the eventual Hyper Beam. Gyarados hits after my first agility, it has to recharge, uses Leer, and my setup is complete. Surf does a third, Gyarados misses Hyper Beam, and I take it down. Dragonair is next. It paralyzes Goldeen before I take it out. But uh, this doesn't matter, because yeah, my speed is enough. I'll still move first against the Aerodactyl. I take my time here, healing with rest and then mimicking Ice Beam. After that, it's a series of three one hits. Now my test showed that Goldeen is about as good against the Jolteon team as it was against the Flareon team. But in practice, will it be the same? Let's see. Sand Slash is first, I Mimic Earthquake, forget to set up, and knock it out with Surf. So now I'm not going to one-hit the Alakazam. This opens me up to getting hit with Kinesis or a special drop from Psychic. It chooses Psybeam instead though, and doesn't confuse. Executor is next, and things slow down here while I set up, heal, and then knock it out with Surf. It's very painful knocking this thing out with Surf. I just, I, God, wish I didn't have to do this. Once it finally goes down, I have to deal with Cloyster. Surf is going to get the 3 hit here, Spike Cannon takes me to half health, and then I knock it out. The following Ninetales falls to a Surf, and now it's Jolteon time. Did I do it? Well, Goldeen's a fast fish, it moves first, uses Earthquake, and that's it. 1 hour, 23 minutes, and 39 seconds, at level 70, with 4 resets and a game time of 5 hours and 11 minutes. I improved everything. Faster real time, faster game time, less resets, and theoretically, I played against the harder rival. I also managed to squeeze one additional level out while doing all of this. So how does Goldeen stack up against the other first stage water Pokemon I've used so far? Well, it's nowhere near Poliwag's dominant performance. It's extremely close to Seal's final adjusted result. Seal was three minutes slower than Goldeen. If we compare game time, Seal actually won. So if I judge exclusively with real time, then Goldeen is in second place. But if I judge with exclusively game time, then Seal is in second place. Now I want to explain why I favor real time over game time. Seal's game time is artificially low, because game time and resets are inversely related. As game time increases, because you did more training, number of resets decrease. So shooting for a lower game time actually makes the Pokemon less consistent. For example, we could run through the entire game, waiting for Gen 1 misses at every key moment in every fight. That would yield the lowest possible game time, but for me, it isn't really proof that the Pokemon was strong. Real time includes the areas where the Pokemon struggles. That's the reason that I record the number of resets. It's to give perspective on the, uh, maybe we could call it the suck factor of the run. In this case, Goldeen had four resets, so it's uh, quite a stable playthrough, it's a low suck factor. 
However, Seal had 16 resets, <laughs> and it was uh, perhaps the most frustrating playthrough that I've done to date. It's very high suck factor. Finally, Goldeen finished two levels higher, but I don't put a lot of stock into this metric. Why does it matter if a Pokemon's at a higher level when it finishes the game? It shouldn't be penalized for that. It seems that finishing at a higher level with a lower time is actually a measure of success. The Pokemon was able to squeeze out more levels faster, likely because it spent less time fumbling around getting beaten up like Seal did. So as a result, Goldeen earns the second place spot in my first stage water Pokemon tier list. When ranked against all the other Pokemon, Goldeen was slower than Slowpoke. Let's soak in the irony that was the fact that Goldeen used agility in this playthrough, and it's slower to complete the game than the slowest Pokemon in the game. Uh. Also, Ghastly, Clefairy, Dragonair, and Slowpoke haven't completed second playthroughs yet, so Goldeen earns its spot near the end of the C tier. Like, subscribe, ring the chime echo, and leave a comment because I gotta read them all. Thanks to all my patrons for their support. If you've made it this far, you're incredible. Now, it's bloopers time. It starts with Peck and Tail Whip. Like, why does it get Peck? Horn Drill makes sense, it's a horny fish after all, but these lips don't look like they'd be good to- Ah, gotta get this joke. <laughs> Never face Vaporeon unless it requires unrealistic- unrealistic- Ah. And then we'll go to live audio from the rapping lass and the status condition junior trainer. Oh, I can't ch 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 Connery. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's like a blooper, but I'm just talking to Sean. Uh, if you want me to do a short, like, gym leader tier list video at some point, let me know in the comments. I think it would be kind of fun. The arrival in Pokemon Tower that follows him is also usual. Uh, turns out both Bubble Beam and... B -b -b -beam. Luckily, I can make a trip to the Safari Zone next to grab rest. Not rest? <laughs> rest is definitely not in the Safari Zone. Although, if we could have another rest TM somewhere, that would be very nice. Fun fact, if you hold B, it actually acts as a brake on the bike, so you can move her around... M move her... Uh, uh. Fun fact, if you hold B when you're on the hill, it acts as a brake for the bike, so you can moon moon maneuver around more precisely. Oh, come on. If you've watched a lot of my videos, you'll know a fantastic strategy against Lorelei is stealing Snow... Snowboro's Amnesia. Using agility right away buffs Goldeen up a bit. Up a bit. Also, three agilities is better because it gives me higher stats due to the badge boost, and I also just won't... With that, it can use Swift to sweep... With that... With that, it can use Swift to sweep... Oh, sweep Sabrina's... Oh, it's so hard. Uh. After that, I settle in for a long training of long training of session. Yes, that's the that's the words. They're in that order. <laughs> uh, they're not. They're not in that order. This time I use Horn Drill to take Cloister out right away before it confuses confuses me. This time I use Horn Drill to take the Cloister out right away before confusing confusing confusing. It's confusing. It's before confusing can mess with me. Is that if this was my Grimer video, I would just leave that in. It's good enough funny thing is I would I would record good lines I'd keep working until I got the good lines and then I would just put the bad line in because it's funny right it's not cringe it's funny let's do oak um mm, not sure about this one I think hypnosis is going to be needed for the uh Venusaur uh might be needed here I don't know what moves this thing has I'm gonna try and steal and see stomp hypnosis okay well it's not gonna spam bleach seed so that's nice if I can put it to sleep, then I can set up for free, essentially. Set up for free. Can heal. Probably wake up while I'm asleep. We both wake up. Oh. <laughs> I'm I'm sick of having to defeat Venus uh Executors with Surf. Uh I think I should just go for it. It's dealing decent damage. I guess it only knows barrage, so there's not much risk here. Ooh. That's annoying. Should heal. Wake up. Oh my gosh. No, no! No! Not like this! Oak battle number two. Um, I don't know if that was the best choice. I think I just take this thing down. Maybe if he uses rage, I should set up agility. I wonder if I should take stomp. Ugh. Stealing sleep moves and getting put to sleep is the theme. No! No! Okay, oh yes! Oh no. Ah. Uh. So I went to get groceries with my fiance after the last loss, and then I came back to try to complete the fight. Hypnosis is gonna work now, I just know it is. With luck on my side, I'm finally able to defeat Oak. Now Goldeen's earned its evolution. It's the king of the sea. 